Welcome, everyone. This is Leading with Empathy and Allyship. It's a, we're a live event and podcast series. I'm your host, Melinda Brianna Epler, the founder and CEO of Change Catalyst, where we build inclusive innovation through consulting, training, and events. In this series, we go deep and we get real. We build empathy and we explore tangible, actionable steps that we can all take to be better allies and better advocates for each other. And speaking of which, uh, we flashed it on the screen earlier, we do have a special research project that we've just launched. Um, and part of that includes an allyship survey. So we'd love your input on that. Um, please fill it out. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, changecatalyst.co slash allyship survey. So today we're talking with Jeannie Gainsberg, the founder of Sal Savvy Ally Action and author of The Savvy Ally. And we're talking with her about being a skilled LGBTQ plus advocate. Welcome, Jeannie. Thank you. Happy to be here. Happy for you to be here. Happy that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just talk about a few logistics and then we'll dive in. So on screen, we have uh, an ASL interpreter, Kalina. Um, she'll be interpreting throughout the episode. Our, our interpreters are sp is sponsored by Interpreter Now, and we're really grateful for that partnership. Uh, we also have live captioning um, by Maggie at White Coat Captioning. The captioning is working again today. So last week we had um, Zoom had some issues, but this week it's back. So just go down to the bottom of your screen, click, click closed caption, and you can make adjustments there as well. And yeah, again, uh, if you have questions specifically, um, the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen, use that so that we can find them easily. We'll, we'll have time at the end of the session to answer some of those questions. Um, but in the meantime, please use the chat as frequently as possible. We'd love to know what you're thinking about. All right, so let's dive in. Um, and Karen says she loves your book, The Savvy Ally. Savvy Ally. Um, practical. What a great way to start. Helpful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> From one author to another. Awesome. Um, so Jeannie, can you tell us about your story? What brought you to write The Savvy, Savvy Ally and to do the advocacy work that you do? What was that journey like? Sure, yeah. Um, I was kind of a late bloomer. Um, I, I grew up, I'm straight and I'm cisgender. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I grew up in a very, very straight cisgender world. Uh, I knew no out LGBTQ plus people growing up. I had no one in my family who identified that way. Um, I didn't meet gay, lesbian, bisexual people until I was in college and I didn't meet um, an out, excuse me, out gay, lesbian, <laughs> and uh, bisexual people until I was in college. Um, obviously I had met them before. And um, I didn't meet an out trans person until I started my work um, at, at age 40 here in Rochester at our local LGBTQ plus center. So I really knew nothing. I had no connection to the communities. Um, I, I know at, when I was in college, there were um, a lot of rallies, um, you know, silence equals death, um, gay rights movements that um, I never participated in. I never knew that I would be welcome. I wasn't sure I'd be welcome. I didn't know the word ally. I didn't know I could join if I wasn't, um, if I didn't have any connection there. So I basically did nothing until I was 40 years old. And then my husband gave me a book called Not For Ourselves Alone, which is the companion book to the um, Ken Burns series on the women's suffragette movement. And uh, I'm reading that book in bed one night and doing the thing I do when I read history, which is like putting myself back in that time period and thinking like, how would I have behaved if I had lived back then? And I, of course, had convinced myself that I would have been very active marching alongside all those wonderful women who fought for my right to vote. And um, I just, it was like, wham, hit me. Like, what a hypocrite I'm being. I mean, I, I felt strongly about LGBTQ plus inclusion my whole life, and I haven't done a thing about it. Um, it was such a strong feeling that in the morning it was still with me and I uh, looked up the word gay in the phone book that'll that'll date this occurrence a little bit that I use the phone book. Um, <laughs> and I found an organization called the Gay Alliance, which was um, at the time our local LGBTQ plus center and I called and asked if I could volunteer. And um, I just to kind of give you some idea where my knowledge base was when I started. Um, in my very first training, I, I had to ask what at the time GLBT stood for because I had no idea. So I was starting from like, no, I knew nothing about the community at all. Um, mm -hmm. And I ended up working at that agency for 15 years. Uh, my final five years, I was the education director, which put me in charge of training all of our speakers, 
um, crafting all of the workshops and writing all of the curriculum. So I ended up with just a wealth of knowledge in my head about how to be an ally. Um, and I knew this stuff was really good because we were running these workshops across the country and um, just getting rave reviews and seeing the change. Um, and typically our, our typical audience member was the person who wanted to do the right thing, but was scared to death that they were going to make a mistake or use an outdated term. Um, and so these folks were really silenced. Um, and I, and these workshops, we were seeing these workshops creating change where people were getting out there and having the conversations and advocating. So I just was like, this, this stuff is so good. I, I, it suddenly clicked that I should put it into a book. Um, so the next thing I did was look to see what was out there because I, I wanted the guidebook when I started and it didn't exist. And I was curious as to whether, you know, <laughs> this thing existed because I felt like we need a guidebook out there. Um, and it, it really didn't. There were a lot of books out there that, that were for allies, how to be an ally. Um, and basically what I found was most of them, even if they advertised as how to be an ally, they ended up being about 70 to 90 percent why to be an ally and then with sort of like a little action chapter at the back and i knew i wanted my book to be 100 percent action pieces if you pick this up um i want you to be on board with lgbtq plus inclusion and just want you know the skills and the tools um i was also surprised a lot of the books that were out there are very high academic level kind of queer theory you know 501 um, and I really wanted to reach the folks that were making up my audiences so the the folks that were maybe not um, very savvy in regards to social justice but were just sort of starting out and wanted to do the right thing so a lot of teachers a lot of parents nurses mental health uh, workers um, and then the final thing that frustrated me a little bit, and I, I think we're probably going to talk about this as we go, um, was that a lot of these books focused so heavily on accountability. Um, and what I mean by that was they had really overwhelming expectations and lists that, you know, you kind of have to check all these things before you can consider yourself an ally and you need to do it 24 seven and you're not allowed to take breaks. And they were very unforgiving of folks that made mistakes. And I was like, oh no, I want my book to be very, very, you know, um, encouraging and forgiving and um, definitely something we'll probably be talking about along the way. But I, I talk throughout my book about how being an ally is an ongoing journey and an ongoing journey of making mistakes, literally, you know, you, you make a mistake, you make an appropriate apology. We can talk about that later if we want to, what that looks like. Um, you forgive yourself and then you put in the work to get it right the next time. And it, it's, it's just ongoing. We're going to make mistakes and we need to, you know, recover gracefully, make sure we're not harming people and figure out how to get it right the next time. And um, so that was really where I wanted my book to focus on. So, so I wrote it and then I um, published it during um, arguably one of the uh, worst times in the history of the world. Um, <laughs> my book came out on March 12th. So you can picture that. Um, everything promptly shut down. My, my book launch was canceled and all my workshops were canceled and my, uh, my editor was furloughed and my publishing company suspended operations for several months. So um, it just makes me so very grateful for people like you, Melinda, who have invited me onto your show to, to talk about my book. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, um, I have hopes for things kind of getting better and kind of working out in the publishing space soon. Um, so, um, and, and appreciate that and appreciate all, all you do. It, it, so it, you've done more than write the book too. You're also, this is basically what you do in your life. Right. Full-time full ally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you, um, well, we might talk about this a little bit more later, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about how you, how you think about allyship. What are some of the things that, well, maybe what are some of the things that came to mind as you were writing the book, as you were thinking about um, representing the um, LGBTQ plus community and, um, you know, that that kind of responsibility as an ally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, writing the book definitely, I think, brought a lot of that sort of my, my responsibility as an ally out because when I was working at the center, um, when I was doing workshops, I made it a point to always partner with someone who was part of the community. So when we did workshops, um, it, it was actually a really beautiful pairing of someone who was part of the community and could share their story and their experiences, and then an ally and folks could ask questions. Um, and of course, when I wrote my book, I, there I was on my own writing a book about how to be an ally. And um, 
so you know that there's I think we we talked in our earlier um, Melinda about sort of that um, that balance that you that you have between um, wanting to be an ally but ensuring that you're also amplifying voices of mar the marginalized community members and um, I really had to find that balance with this book um, you know I was I was a bit worried that there would be backlash um, but there I mean first of all there hasn't been which has been fantastic um, but. I feel like ally spaces are really, really important. And when we, the more I read about all different types of so, social justice movements, the more I'm hearing that um, and understanding, of course, that we, we do, we should not be relying on the marginalized community members to constantly be educating the rest of us. So, you know, the, the, the black people should not be relied upon to constantly be educating white folks. White folks should be talking to white folks and, and sharing how to be a good ally and, and those experiences. And um, so that's very much where I'm coming from is let's let's not constantly rely on the people who are, you know, um, really being hurt by the the um, marginalization or the, the, the language that we're using. Um, let's talk amongst ourselves as allies. Um, and I've also found that ally only spaces are really um, fantastic in that I mentioned the folks that make up my workshop often are people who they're scared into silence. They're scared to death that they're going to say something that's going to accidentally offend someone. So if there is actually someone in the room who's part of that community and they know that, they're less likely to ask their questions because they're really, really worried they're going to hurt somebody and use an outdated term. Um, whereas ally only spaces really allows people to um, just kind of be themselves and 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 ask those questions that maybe are you know <laughs> outdated or or whatever. Um, it's to me, it's kind of a gift that we can give to each other is to create spaces where we really can just ask anything and we can use the language that we know and not worry that we're going to offend somebody. Um, so I think there absolutely is uh, are places for um, allied to allied conversations that that need to be happening. And basically, my switch in education just to kind of sort of complete the thought is that now rather than talking about um, LGBTQ plus education, which is really what we were doing before and creating safe zones and things like that, all of my work now is on allyship. And if I, you know, and I have gotten requests for to do trainings on like, can you teach us like, you know, about trans identities? And the answer is no, like, that's not my role. That's, I won't do that. I'm doing work mm -hmm. on allyship. Right. Um, and so that that's how I balance that. Yeah, yeah. The trans, trans people should be talking about trans identity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, you, you talked about language. Let's let's dive into language in specific. So uh, the, the majority of the audience um, for the podcast and the live audience here has a kind of basic understanding of, of language, I think. But let's let's what should we be thinking about when we're, we're thinking about language in the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community? Sure, yeah. Um, so I actually, I eat, neither in my workshops or in my book do I do a lot of work around like a whole bunch of identities. I think that can be really intimidating. Um, in fact, I've got a warning on the back of my, in the, in the glossary at the back of my book, <laughs> a warning, use this with caution. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm serious about that. I think people see these lists and lists and lists of, of different identities and it's incredibly intimidating. Um, and the fact is that people, um, define their identities in different ways. So even if we look at the dictionary definition of like genderqueer, um, if you ask three different people who are genderqueer to define that, it's gonna, it's possibly gonna sound very different. So, you know, even just, even if we were to learn the entire glossary, which I don't, I'm not recommending that, um, you know, we're still gonna get tripped up because not everyone identifies themselves, it, uh, describes their identity in the same way. So I and also I just just to add to that, it, the language is always changing too. Yeah. There's always new language. The meaning meanings of language changes as new generations kind of own um, different language, and um, and there's just a uh, identity a politics and activism is always changing language as well. So yeah, yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point, and so it's really intimidating. I know people within the communities that are like, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with our own community and all the language changes. So. Um, so I don't focus on that and not to, um, you know, not to downplay that. I think it's important, obviously, to understand identities and learn as we go. But I don't think memorizing a glossary is the, the thing to do. So um, what I do in my book and in my workshops is really share some, some tips that we can use that will help us um, navigate respectful conversations, even if we don't know any of the terms. And so um, I'll share a few of those now if you're, should we? go into actual tips. Are you okay with that? Um, so I'll share two yeah. of my favorites that are just really, really simple and will guide us really well in um, having respectful conversations. And 
literally people don't realize we are, we can create safer and more inclusive spaces with our simply with our language. Um, so the the first one that I like to talk about is ungendering our language, and um, it's funny. Often when I bring this up, there invariably will be one person who says, you know, well I I asked the woman. You know, I saw the woman's wedding ring and I asked her what her husband did and she just corrected me and said that she had, you know, a wife and it was no big deal. So from the asker's side, it often feels like it's no big deal, right? Um, but from the person's side who has the ring, um, what we don't realize often is that we are boxing that person into a, a corner with our gendered language. So, you know, um, if someone were to ask me, oh, what a lovely ring, what does your husband do? I can answer that question probably move through that question without even realizing that that could be challenging for anyone. But if I'm married to a woman, I'm literally boxed into a corner. I have three options of how to respond to this person who I may not even know, right? Who just liked my ring. Um, so one is to flat out lie and say, oh, you know, my husband is, you know, uh, an oncologist. Um, the second is to deflect, you know, what a lovely blouse you have on. And the third is to come out to possibly this total stranger. So, you know, realizing that um, and, and what's going on in my mind at, at that point, right? If I'm thinking about, do I actually own up and, and share that I'm married to a woman? I'm not just talking to this woman. Maybe there's someone behind me who's really homophobic. You know, I'm checking out my environment. There's so much that goes on when we force people into situations where they have to decide whether to come out or not, the grocery store, you know, wherever. Um, so ungendering language is, is really huge. I mean, we use words like partner, use the word like spouse. Um, what you're saying when you use those terms is, um, I understand that not everyone is straight and cisgender. I mean, you know, other than walking around with a big old rainbow pin, which I highly recommend, by the way, um, if you're not doing that, this is like the second best way that you can let people know that you're open to hearing that they are, you know, um, any identity under the sun. Um, so that's a great one. That's step one. Step two to me is um, the one that I share is mirror language. And um, it, it's a step two because the way it works is we use ungendered terms when we have conversations with folks, uh, if we don't know how they identify or how their partner identifies. But once we hear those identity terms, then we latch onto that and we mirror that term. So if someone says, what a beautiful ring, what does your spouse do? And I say, oh, my wife is an oncologist, that person now has valuable information about the terms that I use for my loved mm -hmm. one. Um, and so now they switch from the previous ungendered term of spouse to wife. Um, so those are just two like really simple tips. You don't need to know any identity terms to, to use those. Um, and they really, really help people feel much more included and much safer to uh, be authentic when we're using those terms. Yeah, the, uh, the mirroring in particular, mirroring terms can be used pretty much across identities, right? That um, when you're trying to understand how somebody describes their disability, listen to how they're describing it. How are they, are they saying, are they calling themselves disabled or are they calling themselves somebody with a disability? These are two different terms that, um, and listening for that can um, avoid having to make it a big deal by asking if you can hear it ahead of time. And, um, and, and the second thing is, I think that it's a, one thing that we, that I, I often hear, well, they just corrected me and, um, and, and then we moved on, it's not a big deal. But you have to also think about how many times a day or a week or a month or a year that person is having to correct people too. It's just that, that extra burden having to do that rather than just having a conversation um, about what you want to have a conversation about. Yeah. Is, yeah. I, I think that, um, that that extra burden should not be discounted either. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, you mentioned a little bit of, uh, about creating safe conversations. Uh, we talked about this also a little bit with Corey Ponder in episode 19. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, you, you talk in your book actually about having useful conversations. What does that, what does that mean? How do, how do we do that effectively? Yeah, um, so, so um, chapter seven of my book focuses completely on um, 
how do we basically how do we open people's ears up for conversations rather than shut them down, which is, of course, a, a really important um, conversation to be having um, right around now. I feel like our, our country's gotten very, very divisive. People aren't listening to each other anymore very well. Um, the chapter is called Good Talk, the Art of Having Useful Conversations, and it has really nothing to do with LGBTQ plus people. It's about just people in general listening to each other and talking to each other. Um, and so what I start with is um, talking about how humans are resistant learners. And um, so, you know, if we, if we get an idea of how we all basically have this, I call it our, our lump of knowledge, but basically we have this lump of knowledge in our brain and we've, we've created that our whole lives, right? We, we gather information and this is what we know. Um, and we're pretty stubborn about changing that. And that's, that's human nature. So we get a new piece of information and we don't just stick it in our lump of knowledge and change because our, our world would be chaos if we did that, right? Typically the, the human reaction is you get this new piece of information that doesn't jibe with your lump of knowledge and you dismiss it with like a nah, you know, no. Um, and then maybe you hear it again, and then maybe you hear it again, and then maybe, you know, you hear it from a trusted source, you know, you, you hear it from, a, um, you know, your, your, your parent, a friend, a, a trusted media source, you're going to start paying more attention to it, you know, the seed's been planted, and then eventually we may do that magical thing where we put that new piece of information in our brain and um, get rid of the old one, but it's a long process, and so oftentimes, again, in workshops, I invariably, I get the person who's like, my uncle is so homophobic. You know, what, what is, what can I say to him to change his mind? And of course, my answer is like, there's nothing, there's no one magic, perfectly crafted angel singing in the background oh, response that you're gonna, you know, say to your uncle, that's going to change his mind. That's not how people learn. Um, that's not how any of us learn. So, so I start the chapter with that. And I think that what that does is it takes the pressure off of people to, to really come up with that perfect response. People really want that, that perfect thing to say. Um, and then the second thing I talk about is putting yourself in the hot seat and thinking about a time when um, you said something that was offensive and how the person who responded to that, um, what worked and what didn't work there. So, you know, oftentimes when I when I craft a list with people, we'll hear, you know, I got really defensive because the person was yelling at me or the person, you know, labeled me as, as racist or transphobic or whatever it was, um, or the person, you know, called me out on social media, like all, all things that are going to close this person down to hearing what you have to say. Mm -hmm. um, and then the things that do work are the, the techniques that I talk about in my book, and I won't go through all of them here, but some of them are, um, the assumption of goodwill is, is kind of a theme that I talk about throughout my book, just um, assuming that good intent. And um, I, think, I think it's often misapplied. It doesn't mean, it doesn't take the place of the conversation. It's not like a, oh, they didn't mean it that way, so let's just let them be. Um, it sets the tone for the conversation. The assumption that the person um, didn't, didn't mean to offend um, can take you so far in a respectful conversation. Um, connecting statements are huge. I mean, I did start from zero, like I knew nothing. And so I'm in a really good position to, to make connecting statements. Like, you know what? I used to think that too, because it's often true. Like I was there, I get it. Um, and that really puts me at the same level as this person rather than, you know, like, let me, let me teach you. Um, it's really, it's really more of like, yeah, I get it. Like I, I felt that way too. And, and here's what someone said to me, which really resonated. Um, a much more respectful way to, to talk with someone. Um, and then of course, making it about you rather than the labels. Um, I know in a lot of social justice circles, they say, um, don't label the, um, the person, label the behavior. So rather than say like, you're homophobic, say that comment was homophobic. And um, I go one step further and say, don't label anything. I don't think it's necessary. And it doesn't, it doesn't get us where we need to go. Um, what it will do is go off on a tangent probably what will happen is the person will get so defensive because they don't want anyone to think they said something that was homophobic or racist or whatever. And that will be where the conversation goes off rather than focusing on why that, what you said was, was hurtful to me. And that really is mm -hmm. what, what the conversation should be about, like the impact that that had on me. So those yeah. are just a few of the tips that I share. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the labeling is 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 definitely tricky because once you um, once you ha start that once you have a conversation where you're forcing somebody to think about their own identity in relation to a term um, like race, you know, it's it's uh, like racist, like homophobic. It really does change. Yeah, I agree. It changes the conversation. It changes the the path forward quite a bit. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, there's something to be aware of in conversations. It's, um, so let's talk about, there's a lot of, lot of folks that are tuning in that are in the advocates in their workplaces. They're um, either leaders, managers, directors, or they're diversity, equity, and inclusion advocates looking for you know, ways that we can work on more systemic change in, inside the workplaces. Um, in addition to these individual, the individual things we can do as allies, how can we advocate for the systemic change? And you have a um, you have a chapter in your book uh, where you talk about duct tape patch up jobs versus big fixes. So, you know, what are some of the the, the big fixes? What does that look like? Yeah, yeah, um, and they're both important. I mean, let me just say, like, it's not like um, it's not like one's better than the other. They're both critical. Um, so just to give a little example of that, I mean, you know, basically if someone walks into, um, you know, a, a, let's say a health center and they don't fit, they don't fit the forms, they don't fit, you know, the, the, the boxed uh, restrooms maybe, they're, you know what I mean? Like there are things that have to happen right away that, that are the duct tape patch up jobs, which are the, like the apology, the let me, you know, maybe take this person aside in a side room so that we're making sure that we're not outing the person in front of other people, you know, whatever those little patch up jobs are, but then we also need to look at the, the big long term fixes. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that question, especially considering folks that are listening in. Um, so I would say that workplace leaders um, play such a critical role when it comes to uh, creating inclusive climates. And um, first of all, I think just having the, the understanding that their actions, their, their modeling inclusive actions really seals the deal in workplaces, um, as opposed to the person who's like, well, we've got the diversity department over there and they're, they're taking care of it, right? I mean, this is like, it, it needs to be everyday actions. Um, so some of the things that I would recommend are creating systems um, that, that work for everyone. Um, so rather than, an example would be like, rather than wait until you have maybe um, the new intern who's non-binary and using the singular pronoun they, and all of a sudden everybody's like, you know, oh my gosh, I, you know, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to remember this. Um, you know, how do we, how do we introduce this person? Like it's, it's become this issue because there's this person that doesn't really fit into your traditional way that you've done things. Um, if you establish systems where everybody is um, able to share how they would like to be addressed, um, then it's, it's, it's already there. And when that new intern comes in, they're automatically welcome because those systems are in place. It's not something that you're putting in place because of this one person. So for example, when you are, um, and I, I wouldn't recommend doing this at every like staff meeting, but, but typically in a staff meeting in a workplace, if there's someone new, you do the introduction, you do the, hey, let's just go around and say our name and like maybe what our role is here. So that's a great time to throw in. Um, and if you feel comfortable sharing, so it should be optional. Um, if you feel comfortable sharing, please let us know your pronoun as well. Um, and that's a great opportunity for people to be sharing that, not forcing anyone to do it, but then you get someone new in and that system's already in place. It's natural, everybody feels comfortable sharing their pronouns. Um, and also asking people, how can we refer to you? Um, that, again, this goes beyond just LGBTQ plus stuff. Like how, what's, how should I refer to you on a casual level? And then how would I refer to you in a professional level? So what are your prefixes, right? Do you want, you know, Ms., Mrs., doctor, we wanna make sure we're being respectful. So setting up systems where all of that can be um, uh, gathered from everybody is important. Um, another thing I would, I would mention is, is visibility is so important, especially when it comes to the LGBTQ plus communities. Um, historically, LGBTQ plus people have actually been left out of diversity conversations. And I know that sounds odd. I think that's, it's changing. And so I think people don't realize that history, but, um, 
I'll give you an example. I got my master's degree in social work in 1992. And in the diversity and inclusion course, LGBTQ plus wasn't talked about at all. So it was, it was race and ethnicity and religion and ability. Um, and we didn't talk about LGBTQ plus stuff, but people, communities. Um, that was early 90s. So I'm like, okay, you know, fair. Like maybe they just weren't there yet. But uh, about four years ago, I was doing a training in California and there was a young woman there who had just finished her master's degree in social work. And she said the same thing, like they, it was not included in their diversity class. So what that means is when someone walks into a company or a store and there's a sign up that says, we do not discriminate here, um, it may mean except for you, LGBTQ plus folks, like literally. And so they're, the, that community is often looking for more. Um, they're, they're looking for the rainbow sign that says all families welcome here. They're looking for um, the, the st non-discrimination statements that have all three of those, um, the, the big things we're looking for, which is sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Um, so they're, they're actually looking at, we do not discriminate against LGBTQ plus people spelled out. Um, and, and that visibility is really, really key for an, um, at the administrative level. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Should I keep going or? <laughs> uh, no, well, about this, or? <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, uh, that was great. I, I, there was a question from Nick um, in, in the chat that I do think we should address. Um, Nick says, um, not labeling something as racist or homophobic seems problematic at best. Uh, like the, when the New York Times won't call certain behavior by elected officials as racist. This kind of seems like giving that behavior a pass or moving the goalposts. How can we combat something if we don't name it out of concern or fragility of the perpetrators? How is it productive not to name it and call it abuse and oppression? As a BIPOC bi LGBT plus person, I find this method of not naming things as homophobic or racist as hurtful or and dismissive. Um, so I, I just want to, uh, I'll just say one thing and then I, I'd be, um, love to hear your thoughts from um, Jeannie. Um, so I think there's a distinction between calling someone racist or homophobic and calling it something that somebody says that. And I'm not saying, I, I, all I said in my comment or meant to say in my com comment was that uh, you need to decide, you know, which one you choose takes the conversation down a very different path, can take the conversation down a very different path. So if you're calling somebody um, that, that's, that's, that's approaching their identity and, and that can be a very different conversation than calling a specific thing that they said or did um, uh, as racist or homophobic. So um, I, I, I don't know if that helps Nick, but um, uh, let me know your thoughts. But uh, Jeannie, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so, so I agree with that. I think that, you know, saying that um, you are homophobic, is, you know, that, that's not going to get you anywhere. So, so as I said, a lot of folks are preferring to say what you said was homophobic. Uh, I just want to clarify. So I absolutely agree with this person, um, it, it, you know, in, in the news, in the media, absolutely. Like we need to be calling out folks on racist behavior. Um, this, the question was the, the way that I was framing this was um, that we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. Um, so the situation was someone said something, maybe used a word that was outdated or that was a little bit ouchy for you. Um, that was really the context that I was referring to. And in those situations, you know, let's say it's like a coworker who says something and you're like, oh, that was a little bit, you know, maybe they used it in an outdated term. They didn't, they didn't get the memo. They don't know, whatever. Um, that's where I'm talking about pulling that person aside rather than saying, you know, um, what you just said was racist. Um, I think that person's ears are going to be open to that conversation. I think they're more likely to um, accept that information that you're giving them and put it into their <laughs> lump of knowledge. Um, if you actually talk about the impact that that had on you instead. Here's, here's, here's why I don't like that term. Maybe here's the history of that word. You know, maybe you didn't realize, um, but here's the impact it has on me. And maybe here's a better choice. Uh, here's a more updated word. Here's a, here's a more, a better choice. That conversation is, is going to more likely be heard by the person than if we say what you just did was racist. So I think it's a really different setting than, um, than media, than, than politics, than, 
um, different platforms like that. I hope that clarified my point. Um, yeah, and it will uh, take additional questions um, in, in the next few minutes. If anybody has additional questions, please put them in the Q&A there. Um, but Nick, thank you for your response. And, and Nick responds here, thanks for clarifying in some way, much appreciated. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, the, and the, this this work is hard. It's not easy. To, it's not easy to be an ally, and these these conversations are can be very difficult to navigate. And and I you know um, I usually approach them with you know how can you change the somebody's actions? How can you change them? And and so and everybody changes. Um, in different ways, um, motivated by different things. So, so if your your motivation is to get somebody to fundamentally shift their their actions, shift their ideology, then um, then unfortunately we do have to like understand where they're coming from and try to um, try to turn turn them. And it, it can be toxic. It can be hard. These are these are hard conversations to have and hard work to do. So um, it's, it's messy and. There's no um, perfect solution. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's interesting. I, I've had conversations with people where my, my goal isn't even to turn them, as you say. Um, it's really just to just to have an opportunity to, to, to listen to each other. Um, so I actually share a, a, a situation that happened to me once. I was in a workshop and I, I, it was a mandatory workshop. So always a different feel than an optional workshop. So I, I knew there were going to be some unhappy campers there. Um, and one, one unhappy camper raised his hand and said in such an incredibly polite way that I, it took me a, a minute to realize that he was pushing back on what I was saying, but he basically was saying, you know, you just came into my place. Um, he, he was a, a school staff member, but you just came into my school to share your beliefs may I now come into your space and share my beliefs? Um, and then he sort of started talking about some of his beliefs, which were very anti-LGBTQ+, but he did it in such a respectful, kind, soft-spoken way that I was like, this is someone I wanna talk to. I mean, really, that was my reaction. I'm like, I rarely hear someone who's so against the work that I'm doing around inclusion in the classrooms um, and in schools in, in such a in such a polite way, so I, I I did at the end of the conversation at the end of the workshop I gave him my card and I I invited him out to dinner, um, and he said he actually went to his priest because he was very nervous about going out to dinner with me and asked do you think I should do this and the priest said I don't I don't see why not so we we went to the cheesecake factory and had what you know stands as one of the most amazing educational experiences of my life I mean I we we. We were able to talk the whole time without getting angry. We listened to each other, where we're coming from. We, we, I mean, I think one of the things that stood out for me was how much we had in common. Like we were coming at our, our views, what we wanted for the world and what we wanted for children from completely different sides, but we had so much in common. And one of the things kind of getting back at my, my point of like changing people was that when we left that that evening, gave each other a hug, I and mean, we had a great dinner. He even was like, "Let's do this again." Um, we left, and I realized, like, I don't think either one of us has changed a, a, a smidgen on our core beliefs. But we we basically we had such a such an understanding of where the other person was coming from, and so much more respect. And I think that. So those conversations aren't, aren't happening at all. And I feel like they should be, right? Our goal maybe shouldn't be, I'm going to change this person, but just like, let's just listen to where people are coming from. Um, I, I just learned so much from him about, to me, it helped me as an educator because I now had a, a better understanding of what he was thinking when he walked into a session, a mandatory session that he had to sit through on LGBTQ plus inclusion, feeling really, really angry that he had to be there. I had, I had a much better sense of how I could have approached that workshop. And it made me a better educator. Um, so, you know, I, I just think that it, it was an it was an amazing experience, and um, I just don't think we have enough. We don't talk enough with people who think differently than we do. Um, Melinda asks. Uh, I agree with asking people at meetings, etc., if they want to say their pronouns, but when is it appropriate to ask someone their pronouns in a small one-on-one -on -one setting or small group? 
uh, I never want to make assumptions that someone is trans or non-binary or would like me to use a pronoun based on my perception of their gender presentation as cisgender feminine presenting woman. I have never been asked what pronouns I prefer. Oh, wow. Okay, really? Well, that surprises me in this day and age. <laughs> I feel like it's a lot more out there, but I absolutely agree. I don't think we should wait until we sort of, you know, see the one person who we're not quite sure, and then all of a sudden pronouns become an issue, which is why um, I, I do encourage people to um, to create, create situations where we're asking everybody. Um, but in a situation like that, to answer your question, which is sort of more one-on-one, -on -one, um, the way that I, I often approach it by offering mine first, and I'm so embarrassed because I've, I've been on Zoom now for like months and I just realized my pronouns didn't come up right here by my name. I don't know why they're supposed to. <laughs> they did yesterday. So anyway, I'm sorry. Usually I have my pronouns there, which is a great way to show your pronouns without people having to ask. Um, but I will often share my pronouns first. So if I really feel the need to ask, I will, you know, it, 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 again, in order to be respectful, um, I'll say, hi, I'm Jeannie. You know, I use she, her, and her pronouns, you know, nice to meet you. And oftentimes people will respond with, hi, I'm so-and-so and here are my pronouns. Um, so that, that's one way to just make it a little bit easier rather than just coming right up and asking somebody their pronouns. Um, I also, um, interestingly that the person used the, the word um, preferred. Um, so that's actually something that I recently learned was I, um, for a long time people were asking others for their preferred pronoun. And um, recently we've kind of dropped the preferred. And the reason that, that um, I'm understanding that we did that is because um, preferred preference kind of implies like, you know, um, oh, I, you know, I, I, I like, you know, uh, margaritas, but I prefer margaritas, but a martini will do, you know, I mean, it's just like, it, it's not that important. It's just kind of, you know, um, what I'm feeling like right now, or rather than a, an integral part of who someone is. And so um, we don't typically ask cisgender people what their preferred pronoun is. It's, it's just our pronoun. And so um, we actually have dropped the preferred. So um, just yeah, a little- It's not optional, little, it just is. <laughs> the ally tip. Yeah, so I actually, yeah. I used to say preferred all the time and now I've dropped that and I just ask people their pronouns. Um, so that will get you also a little bit further as far as using um, terms that aren't outdated to just ask what people's pronouns are. Um, but again, I mean, your, your question is, is such a good one because we, we're, we're often in situations where it's really awkward and we don't walk around asking people their pronouns Typically what happens is we, we, we look at people and we, we make assumptions based on their gender expression and we guess. And you know most of the time we're right and some of the times we're wrong and that's how then we stumble and we recover. And you know what that looks like is an apology, a quick apology. Um, I like to say it should be as if you bumped into someone on the street, right? You're not gonna just ignore them because that's rude but you're not gonna like, you know, start sobbing on their shoes and overly apologizing. Cause then all of a sudden it's about you, right? Uh, I've, been, I've seen awkward, awkward situations where like someone misgenders someone and then the person who was misgendered is actually, you know, um, trying to make the other person feel better which is ridiculous. So just a simple mm -hmm. apology, I'm so sorry. Um, and then put the work in to get it right the next time. Um, one, some things that I do when I misgender somebody. So a few things I like to do is if I'm in a conversation with that person, I will make a point of using that pronoun at some point in that same conversation right away. And I do that partly to cement that in my head, but also to let that person know that I'm trying, that I, I, I'm intentionally going to work to get it right the next time. And I want them to see that and hear that. Um, so that's one of the, that's one of the things that I, I do. Um, I have a lot of tips because I, I find singular they difficult. I know a lot of people do using that as a pronoun. Um, I also like to, I will actually practice in my head before I say the, the, the sentence that involves singular they, um, that, that's helped me got, get much better at it as well. And, um, and another little tip that I, I love um, is to um, a non-binary friend of mine who uses they said, just, just picture me with a, a mouse in my pocket. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, that's so that's so perfect, right? And so you know, they're coming to dinner. Get out the mini cheese tray. Um, so those are just a few tips that have helped me. But we're we are going to mess up, and we don't live in a world where we're walking around saying, "Hi, I'm Jeannie, she, her, hers," um, unless we're at you know, creating change, the big LGBTQ conference where you actually do walk around saying that, and it's kind of cool. It's like queer planet. <laughs> yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, it's much, much easier to do in a one-on-one -on -one setting than in a group 
group setting, um, you know. Uh, so just, you know, I, I would try to do it one-on-one -on -one whenever you can so that you're not like outing somebody in front of a group or, you know, um, enforcing that them to, again, like you said, or Jean, like you said earlier, um, forcing somebody to make that, that decision in front of a group. Um, uh, awesome. Um, uh, we have another question from Christy. Uh, is it okay for people who are not from the LGBT community to use the word que queer? Mm, that's a great question. Um, actually, can I, can I, I was going to possibly offer a pop quiz and that's one of them. Should I read my pop quiz? Oh yeah. Yeah. Do that. that yeah. Will address that. yeah. Fun. So one of the, one of the things that I, that I did in my book to try and keep it um, interesting and not super, not super heavy and academic is I, I threw in a lot of pop quizzes um, and that's one of them because that's a very common question. Thank you for that. Um, so pop quiz is um, choose all that apply. I suppose we get a people vote by, by chat. Can they type in some numbers? Um, okay, so A is uh, queer is an offensive term that historically was used against LGBTQ plus people and should never be used. Um, B, some people love the word queer and others hate it. Proceed with caution. And C, queer is a word that has been reclaimed by the LGBTQ plus communities and is now okay to use. So those are those are the three choices. Melinda, are we able to see people people's votes or? Yes. Can you see the, some? the chat? I yeah. I'm not seeing the chat. So. Oh. I just see numbers. Oh yes, I am. I'm sorry. All right. I only, I only see one. Anyway, okay. So the, so the answer is, have, is, I'm sorry. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of Bs and Cs. A lot of Bs and Cs, okay. And um, so the answer, a, B, and C. the answer is B. Um, some people love the word and others hate it. Proceed with caution. Um, so my response is that I actually, actually know folks who would be very offended if I used the word queer to refer to them. And I know people who would be really offended if I didn't. So we're in a situation where it's very difficult to navigate a, a, a world where people have such strong feelings about this word. Um, I told you I worked at the Gay Alliance, which was our, our local LGBTQ center, unfortunately recently shut down. Um, but we, about three years ago, changed our name to a more inclusive name. And um, the folks that were thinking about the name change were pondering the word queer. And we had a very, very active and vibrant older adult um, LGBTQ uh, community that that used our our community center and um, they basically many of them told us oh, we're not walking through the door if you use the word queer we're, we just won't come back uh, we're so offended by that term so um, I just I just basically say use with caution um it's funny I actually just used it right now I, I've only ever used it in reference to creating change um, which is I call it queer planet um it is it is so embraced there as a word um, L, creating change is the big LGBTQ plus um, national conference. But um, I never use that word unless I unless I hear someone using it for themselves. So this would be a great opportunity to to mirror terms. I just think there are still a lot of people who are very offended by it, um, and others who just love it and embrace it. Um, I mean, one of the things I love about the word queer is that it really um, it doesn't force people to have to pick a letter, if you will. You know, a lot of folks are are several of the letters in the LGBTQ plus. Um, initialism. Um, some don't feel like they, they have to identify, they want to identify, but they do want to be part of the community. Um, there's a lot of beautiful things about the word queer, um, but I definitely would use it with caution. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, anybody else have, have questions? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more here. Um, Jeannie, so you talk about, um, in your book, you talk about taking care of ourselves as allies. And I do think that is an important piece of this that, um, and, 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 and I just wanna kind of frame this, that being somebody from an underrepresented group and being from a marginalized group, um, you, we, you, we all need to take care of ourselves. Um, and that is that is key, and that is super important. And allies need to um, 
help step step in and uh, step up so that th so that everybody can take care of themselves and um, and um, part of allyship I believe is and and you have said is taking taking the burden of education off um, whenever we can and um, having said that allyship is also can be difficult and um, I think especially in 2020 I'm definitely as an ally realizing just how much I need to take care of myself in moments um, so that I can be a good ally um, what uh, what do you do to take care of yourself um yeah I, I work on trying to forgive myself a lot um, <laughs> mm. I think you know I'll speak for myself um, I'm I'm very 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 forgiving of other people. And I'm really, really hard on myself. And I know that. And so, you know, not if, but when I make a mistake, because we all do, um, I really, really tend to beat myself up over that. And I need to um, find ways to not do that. And, you know, one of my little tips, I, my final chapter is on sustainability and, and self-care and taking care of yourself. Um, but one of the tips is I, I, I read this somewhere in a magazine, like basically you know, think about what you would say to your best friend in this situation and then flip that back on yourself. And, and that, that does help me. I mean, I, I, um, I, I really, I have to, all, I preach so much about making mistakes and then I get so angry at myself when I make my own. Um, I think that's important for me. Um, I, um, so, so some of the tips, I'm just looking at my book, some of the tips that I talk about are, um, so self-coaching tips are really important. Um, I'm actually also a, a volleyball coach. And so I, a lot of my things that, that help me out are, um, are from athletics, but um, especially as adult athletes, we don't often get coached anymore. And so I will find myself when I'm playing sports, um, self-coaching things that will little tips for myself as I'm, as I'm performing. Um, and I do the same again with, um, with allyships is just sort of those little helpful hints my, in my own head. Um, positive things I can say to myself, things that, um, that give me self-confidence. Um, I find those really, really helpful. Um, I think um, I don't tend to take a break, if you will, in some ways, because as I said, I'm like, I'm, I'm like a professional ally, which is kind of weird. Like not too many people say that, but you know, this is, this is what I do. Um, but I think we need to allow ourselves to take breaks. I, I've, I've, I have seen, um, people write that allies don't get to take breaks. It's, this 20, it's a 24 seven job, you don't get to take a break. Um, and, and I have to say, I find that really, really um, difficult. I mean, you know, with, with all the things vying for our time, right? Our jobs are, you know, keeping the, you know, shopping and the children and the walking the dog and the, you know, you're taking care of your elderly parents and like all these things. And, and then, you know, you, you get those surprise things that happen, you know, something happens with your health or the car breaks down. Um, I think it's, it's, it is fair to realize that there are going to be times in your life where um, you're going to be more active than others because of things that are, that are um, essential to you and keeping you safe and happy and healthy. Um, and so that to me feels a, a little bit unfair. And I think that allies need to forgive themselves if they can't maintain the same level of allyship consistently throughout their life. I, I don't think that's a, a fair ask. Um, and if we're going to do this well, it's, it's, um, it's funny, I've, I've never read this in any other book, but I felt this was so important to add to mind this, this idea of, of sustainability, I think is so important because like, like a, we don't want it to be like a bad diet, right? We, oh, I just read the savvy ally and I'm going to dive into this head first and, you know, and, and do all this stuff and, and, and burn out, right? Because I'm like, you know, just tried too hard or did too much, or I'm disillusioned. We want this to be um, a lifelong thing. And so we need to find ways that it's going to fit into our lives and that's going to work. And we need to um, find things that we, that uh, skills that work for us as well. Like that's another thing as allies, there's a lot of things we can do as allies and some things are, are going to um, be things that we enjoy doing and that we're skilled at and others are going to be things that we're really intimidated by. Um, and we don't need to do them all. Um, one of the things I talk about is, um, you know, I, I am involved politically, but, but I really hate the, um, the Equality and Justice Day that we have here in Albany, where you you go to the state, it's this one day, and you talk to your politicians. And um, I I hate it. And I I went once, and I I'm in, kind of embarrassed to say I, I I didn't do it again. I didn't make myself do that. I does that make me a bad ally? Some people might think it does. I feel like all of the other things that I that I do um, 
make up for the fact that I hate that, that one day I don't like talking to politicians. I've taken it off my plate. I do a lot of other things. And I think we should be allowed to do that as allies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, Jeannie, where can people learn more about you and your work? Oh, that's an easy question. Um, <laughs> I have a website called SavvyAllyAction.com. Um, on that website, you'll learn um, where to purchase my book if you're interested. Um, I have been making little three minute fun videos that are uh, on my website, also on YouTube on, uh, with Savvy Ally Tips. Um, things like, you know, what's up with singular they pronoun and um, what's up, I just, just finished one on what's up with um, ungendered, uh, all gender restrooms, um, what to do if we mess up. Anyway, so a bunch of videos. Um, I have some free handouts on how to create inclusive uh, environments in the workplace, how to talk with our, um, how to support our children, things like that. Um, so that's the best place is my awesome. website. Thank you. Great. Great, thank you. Thanks for this, and thanks for sharing. Um, sh thanks for sharing your story and the work that you're doing, and the um, the pieces that I think we can all take into our work as we continue to grow as allies. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so everyone, um, pick something that you will do differently as a result of this conversation, and. Um, and then if you would, again, I said this at the beginning, but please take a moment to, to fill out our allyship survey at changecatalyst.co slash allyship survey. Uh, we'd be very grateful, very grateful. I'd be very grateful for your time and um, appreciate you all in that. And join us each week and for Leading with Empathy and Allyship. Uh, next week, we will have tech inclusion um, so on Tuesday, so we won't be meeting live, um, but I will be recording a podcast that will go up the following week as um, to, to keep with our cadence of podcasts that will be a podcast from me directly. So next week, come to tech inclusion. The following week is um, with K.R. Lu, who's amazing. She's um, been a disability advocate for a very long time. Uh, love her, uh, you will love her. Um, so please join us. You can RSVP for future sessions and sign up for our newsletter at changecatalyst.co slash allyship series. And please do subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel and um, give us a thumbs up on that. That really helps makes a difference or a star depending on what platform you're using. And uh, see you next time. Thanks everybody.